All right, gonna do a video on this Calvinist named Matt Slick. And uh, it's not really about him per se, but mostly just showing the fact that Calvinism is rooted and basically uh, uh, founded upon eisegesis of scripture and essentially emotionally based arguments when it comes to, uh, because what they do is they have a select few verses they'll use and then beyond that, if you ever debate them, they'll just use all these emotional type arguments. But you're gonna see that, because again, it's not really atta an attack on him per se, but just showing the fact that Calvinism is a man-made, man-centered ph uh, philosophy and false doctrine that is totally rooted in just emotion and uh, very little scripture. So I'm gonna show some clips uh, showing this, this Gnostic heresy of Calvinism is clearly not of the Lord because not only is it totally uh, inconsistent with scripture, it's also just rooted in emotion and personal feelings and logic no different than the charismatic movement or even just Roman Catholicism. So here's the first clip where uh, Matt Slick, and, and by the way too, this is not a promotion of uh, Jesse Morrell. Okay, Jesse Morrell has got plenty of his own problems. Uh, in fact, he's kind of the extreme other end because you see Calvinism versus Pelagianism are it's, it's basically two extreme opposites and two false doctrines battling with each other. Okay, Calvinism is heresy, no doubt about that, but so is Pelagianism. I've done videos refuting both Calvinism and Pelagianism. So anyway, uh, this clip I'm going to show is Matt Slick appealing to a, a typical Calvinistic, non-biblical, emotion-based claim uh, that basically against free choice and saying that free choice must be heresy because it quote-unquote excludes God. So here's the clip. You can see it for yourself. Unfortunately, Mr. Morrell uh, has a, a, a faulty starting point. His standard of righteousness when it comes to free will is man-centered, not God-centered. His own words, I'll show you. Free will is the ability to self-originate. Can God do this? The ability to self-originate or create your own moral character. Free will is the power of contrary choice. Can God choose contrary to his own nature, his own holiness? No, he cannot. Can he ever choose to do evil? No, he cannot. Free, he says on page five, free will is the ability to obey or disobey the law of God. That's not free will. God cannot disobey his own law. He says, free will is also the ability to obey or disobey the gospel, page 5. God can't do that. By his definition, he's excluded God himself from having free will. Now, I looked through his book. I didn't read everything because it's huge. But that is a faulty place. Look, whenever you start with man and then you start making theology based on man's standard, you're going to end up in error. And that is the case. Free will is the ability to make choices that are uncoerced, that are not forced, but are consistent with your nature. That's what free will is. That means God is the standard of what free will is. We are made in his image. Genesis 1.26. We're not made in the image of some other man. We're made in the image of God. God has free will. He does not have the power of contrary choice. If that's the standard of what free will is, then God doesn't have free will and man is the standard and that's a problem. And, and logically speaking, when you make conclusions based on a faulty assumption, your conclusions are faulty or suspect at the very least. And right here we see kind of the inherent problem of Matt Slick's argument because in this clip, Matt is using a non-biblical, extra-biblical, emotionally based claim that free choice, it must be heresy because it quote unquote excludes God. Okay, uh, if you watch the full debate, he never actually addresses the scriptures that Morel quoted, nor does, he, nor does he himself prove from scripture that free choice excluding God makes it unscriptural. You know, and by the way, free choice does not exclude God, but because it's God who gave us that free will. So how does that exclude God? You know, he doesn't make his point very well. But the problem stems from the fact that Matt has this pre this pre commitment to this Gnostic heresy of Calvinism, and it causes him to have to reinterpret Scripture by eisegesis and make these verses uh, to try and fit his preconceived ideas of theology based on a select few proof texts. Okay, the Bible clearly teaches the power of contrary choice. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter eleven, verse twenty six to twenty eight, Deuteronomy chapter thirty verse 15 to 20, and Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 8 to 9, Israel is told that God was setting before them blessings and cursings, uh, blessings if they obey and cursings if they disobey, and that he set before them life and death, and he admonishes them to choose life, showing they had the power of free choice and contrary choice between obedience and disobedience to God. 
Okay, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 down to verse 22, and 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, Israel is admonished to choose between serving false gods or serving Jehovah, uh, showing again that they had the free will ability to choose whether to serve God or not. They had the power of contrary choice. Okay, so even if it quote unquote excluded God, which it does not, uh, but even if it if it quote unquote excludes God, it's a concept taught in Scripture. Okay, and and like I said, it does not exclude God because God is the one who gave us that free will. Okay, but anyway, see, he doesn't prove his point. It's all just based on emotion, which is pretty much Calvinism in a nutshell. So anyway, on to the next clip. Jesse did not deal with the issue of uh, of free will uh, that I raised. His definition still excludes God. Let me ask you, do you want to base a theological perspective on something as important as free will when that definition itself excludes God himself? Is not God the standard? God says in 1 Peter 1.16, be holy for I am holy. Does he not set himself up as the standard of righteousness and truth? Absolutely. You need to ask yourself if what you have done is supplanted God and put yourself there. You need to ask yourself if you are putting your own wisdom and your own ability and your own desires for your own sovereign free will above the very majesty of God himself. I urge you to examine yourself to see if that's the case. And how can we test that? Very simply, if you agree with Mr. Morell's definition of free will that it has to be the power of contrary choice and the ability to sin and choose to not sin and to sin, then God himself doesn't have that and God is excluded. Then God doesn't have free will. That means God's not the standard of the theological presupposition that he needs to build on and that's what is dangerous. He didn't address this and it's an important point. If he's going to build an argument based on a faulty assumption and a faulty premise, then his conclusions are suspect. Now, again, we see Matt Slick using this emotionally based argument that, uh, well, free choice must be heresy because it excludes God in his mind. Okay. Again, Matt still never actually addresses or responds to the scriptures that Morel quoted, nor did Matt prove from scripture why free choice, quote unquote, excluding God makes it unbiblical. Again, this is Calvinist eisegesis on full display. Uh, in fact, throughout most of the debate, Matt Slick barely actually gave any responses to the scriptures refuting Calvinism. All he did was either repeat the usual Calvinist out of context proof text or use typical canned Calvinist replies like, oh, free choice is man centered or free will is heresy because it excludes God. But he, without actually properly or directly addressing and refuting the, the scores of scriptures that go against Calvinist heresy, okay? Here's just a couple of these uh, that show free will and prove contrary choice and prove, you know, pretty much refute all five points of Calvinism. So first of all, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 6, and Hosea 5, 15, Israel refused to know God, even though God wanted to know them. Okay. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 2 to 7, Jeremiah 3, verse 6 to 10, uh, Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9 to 14, Zechariah 1, verse 2 to 4, and Amos chapter 4, verse 6 to 11, God tried to bring Israel to repentance and desired that they repent and even chasten them, but Israel still refused to repent and hearken to him. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20 down to verse 22, and Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, God uses metaphorical language to express the fact that he set up Israel for success, but it turned out the other way, against his will, pretty much. In Psalms 81, verse 10 to 14, and Isaiah 48, verse 17 to 19, God is actually bemoaning and mourning over the children of Israel refusing to hearken to his voice, as if they could have and obviously should have acted otherwise. In uh, Jeremiah 33, verse 2 to 3, Jeremiah 38, verse 20 down to verse 21, and Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 6 to 8, God is trying to persuade the children of Israel to make the choice to call unto him and hearken to him. In Jeremiah 7, 31, Jeremiah 19, 5, someone's calling me, sorry about that, let me just get back. Alright, sorry about that, you know, a little interruption there, but anyway, back to the scriptures proving free will and refuting Calvinism. Uh, in Jeremiah thir uh, 7, verse 31, Jeremiah 19, verse 5, and Jeremiah 32, 35, the children of Israel were sacrificing their babies to Baal, and God said it didn't even come into his mind that they would do such wickedness. Okay, it was not his desire for them to do that. Uh, examples where God gives Israel two alternative choices to either obey God and get a blessing or disobey God, and God will repent of the good that would benefit them and their curse essentially uh, you can read about that in jeremiah 18 verse 8 to 10 jeremiah 21 verse 8 to 9 amos 5 verse 4 to 6 deuteronomy 11 verse 26 down to verse 28 
and Deuteronomy 30, verse 15 down to verse 20. They're given alternative choices and told to choose. Okay, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 17 down to verse 21, Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 to 31, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 5 to 11, and Matthew chapter 8, verse 25 to verse 27, Jesus rebuked men, including his own disciples, for actually lacking faith as if they could have and should have had more faith and that Christ wanted them to have more faith, but didn't get it from them. Okay, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 10 to 11, and 1 Samuel 15, 35, God set up Saul as king of Israel and then regretted it and repented of it, uh, meaning he changed his mind about it, uh, when Saul disobeyed God and provoked him to anger by his sin. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, Mark 16, 14, and Luke 24, verse 25 to 26, Jesus marveled and rebuked the unbelief of his own people and even rebuked his disciples for being slow of heart to believe as if they could have and should have believed faster. In Psalms 78, verse 40 down to verse 42, Psalms 78, verse 56 to 59, Psalms 95, verse 8 to 10, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 to 17, God is grieved and angered and wroth against Israel when they refuse to hearken to him and they resist his calling, as if they should have acted otherwise, and could have had the, and had the ability and could have acted otherwise. Uh, in, Hos in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, and Jeremiah 4, 22, God rebukes Israel, uh, and basically they're rejecting his knowledge as if they could have and should have acted otherwise. Okay, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 4 to 9, God expresses shock and, and actually marvels at the arrogance of Israel and their complete obliviousness to their own sin, showing that they should have known better, but were acting this way, and, it was the, and you see in the passage, it was actually their own fault. They had no one to blame but themselves. Uh, also, you see examples where, for example, Israel set up kings apart from God's desire and will, Hosea 8.4. Israel was rebuked by God for taking counsel apart from him, Isaiah 30, verse 1 to 3. Israel separated themselves from God by their sin, and it was their own fault for doing so, Isaiah 59, verse 1 to 2. And God continually tried to reach out to Israel, but they were disobedient and again saying people, again by their own doing. Romans 10.21 and Isaiah 65, verse 2 to 5. I mean, just scripture after scripture proves free will. So even if it did quote unquote exclude God, it's just, I mean, it's a mountain of scripture that proves free will and refutes Calvinism. So this emotionally based argument is just that, it's emotion, it's not scriptural. So anyway, on to the next clip. Are you, I sometimes I ask people questions who are against the reform perspective and I'll say, do you take credit for your own believing? Yeah, I take credit for my own believing. I'm the one wise enough. I'm the one good enough. I was the one in my sin. I was good enough to choose Jesus. I knew it. I take credit for it. Philippians 129, God grants that you believe. They said to Jesus, what must we do to work the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe on whom he has sent. John 6, 28, 29. Do you have the power to repent of your own? 2 Timothy 2, 25. God grants repentance. I'm quoting his scriptures. This is what it says. Do we have the freedom to choose? Absolutely, we have the freedom to choose. But we don't have, as unbelievers, the freedom to choose God. Because if we did, then we wouldn't need to be predestined. We wouldn't need to be chosen. We wouldn't need to be granted belief. We wouldn't need to be granted repentance. We wouldn't have to be appointed to eternal life. And God is not reactionary. Now in this uh, clip, we see that Matt Slick is just parroting the usual Calvinist proof text that he wrote, that he basically has in his opening statement. Uh, and basically he says, oh, I'm quoting scriptures, I'm quoting scriptures, but in reality, just I see Jesus of scriptures taken out of context by the Calvinists. The interesting thing, interesting thing about him saying, I'm quoting the scriptures, is due to the fact that Morel was also quoting scriptures. In fact, the scriptures that were actually basically flowing out of Morel's mouth when he gave his points. If you watch the debate, Mel, Morel is constantly giving scriptures. Again, not promoting Morel, he's got plenty of his own heresies, but you see how he really ha knew uh, the scriptures that more so than Matt Slick did, I'll put it that way. Okay, the fact is that Morel quoted more scriptures in his first 12 minute section than Matt did for a good chunk of the debate. Okay, all that Matt did was just parrot his same verses. I mean, whenever Matt would often, uh, whenever he would record scripture, he would just, you know, parrot the same usual Calvinistic proof text over and over again. Uh, and he often would resort to typical Calvinistic emotionally based arguments that are often non-biblical and even unbiblical as well. Okay, uh, when Matt, like I said, when he actually would quote scriptures, it was just, you know, the usual verses like John 1, 13, Philippians 1, 29, etc. And he, you know, he would quote the verses and just say, well, that's what it says. That's what it says. But they're out of context. The problem with Calvinism is their whole Gnostic, Gnostic perversion of Christianity revolves around a select few verses. And often they will read other scriptures in light of their 
twisted proof text. I often say it's like, you know, I liken it to like basically a solar system of heresy. Their select few proof texts are the sun and all the other scriptures revolve around their eisegesis of their handful of proof texts. Okay, this is why Matt Slick could not properly answer the scriptures Morel quoted since he's likely, he likely wasn't able to make these verses fit into his solar system and revolve around his select few out-of-context proof texts. Again, the problem with Calvinism is that Matt has a pre-commitment to this heresy, this Gnostic heresy, and it causes him to have to reinterpret the scriptures by eisegesis and make these verses fit his preconceived ideas of theology, which are just based on out-of-context proof texts. So anyway, on to the next clip. We're born again, not of our own wills. John 1, 13 says so, not of our own will. It says it. Now again, he, you know, I mentioned he likes quoting John 1, 13. He says, you know, John 1, 13, John 1, 13 says we're not born of our own will. And he gets all worked up over it and says, well, that's, that's what it says. That's what it says. Okay. If you, I've actually noticed when I watched the debate myself, all throughout the debate, Matt Slick seemed to get very, uh, quite restless and rather worked up when he wasn't able to answer the scripture as refuting his theology or outright refused to apparently uh, as it as it appeared to you know if you watch the video he didn't really address in fact he really kind of didn't address any verses Morel gave but a side issue but he would constantly just quote his own verses the usual Calvinist proof text just repeat them and say well that's what it says that's what it says but the problem is that he's reading his own theology into the text and then just saying well that's what it says okay the verses only line up with Calvinistic doctrine if you don't read the context and cross-reference and compare scripture with scripture. Okay, I would know this because I've actually done videos going through Calvinistic proof texts and answering them, and I show how reading these verses in context shows that there is no Calvinist doctrine being taught whatsoever. And, uh, and often reading the context and cross-referencing with other scriptures reveals that these Calvinist proof texts actually end up being verses that can be used against Calvinism. Okay, it is worth noting too, by the way, uh, that there is you know truth to some of his theology, but it's it's a twisted kind of perversion of the truth. He both sides, Pelagianism, Calvinism, are both two extreme opposites of each other, and both of them are heresy. Both contain elements of truth, but in the end, both are just false doctrines and heresy, okay? When it comes to the sinful flesh, uh, mankind does have sinful flesh, that is true. Okay, the doctrine of sinful flesh and corrupt nature is scriptural, however, total depravity and total inability is a perversion of that. I've done videos refuting that, okay? But here are some scriptures that do demonstrate the sinful, corrupt nature of mankind. Okay, for example, no man can say they are uh, in their heart pure or clean from sin. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 9. No man is clean that is born of a woman. Uh, Job 15, verse 14 to 16. Job 25, verse 4 to 6. And Job 14, verse 1 to 4. Even in his best state, mankind is still vanity. Psalms 39, verse 5 to 11. Uh, Psalm 62, verse 9. And Psalm 144, verse 4. No man could stand if God were to mark his iniquities. Psalms 30 verse, or sorry, Psalms 130, verse 3 to 4, Psalms 143, verse 1 to 2, and Job 10, verse 14. No man can say they are perfect or without sin, and if they do, they're lying. Okay, Job 9, verse 20, and 1 John 1, verse 8 to 10. All of man's righteousness are as filthy rags in God's eyes. Okay, uh, Isaiah 64, verse 4 to 8, we're by nature, you know, children of wrath, Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3. Uh, there is nobody that doesn't sin, Ecclesiastes 7.20, 1 Kings 8.46, and 2 Chronicles 6.36. Uh, sinful man's heart is wicked and untrustful, Jeremiah 17.9, and also it's, it imagines evil from youth, uh, Je sorry, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, not good at reading on my computer. Sinful man is accustomed to evil, Jeremiah 23, verse 22 down to verse 23. Man is born in corruption and sin, Psalm 51, verse 5, Psalms 58, verse 3, Isaiah 48, verse 8, and Proverbs 22, verse 15. Okay, uh, Even the saved, born-again saint has corrupt bodies of flesh that are described as quote-unquote vile bodies in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 down to verse 21, and these vile bodies are not redeemed till the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 down to verse 54, and Romans chapter 8, verse 21 down to verse 25, and, and even the saint still has a struggle between the lust, of the, the lust of the sinful flesh and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 down to verse 23. Okay, so that we do have a sinful, corrupt body, body of the flesh, I'll put it that way, but the, the heresy of total inability is unscriptural as I've proven in other videos. Okay, Romans 2, verse 14 to 15 talks about how even the Gentiles, you know, do, do, do basically, have, basically have the law written in their hearts and do that by nature. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 26 down to verse 27 talks about how homosexuality, for example, is against our nature. So total depravity is not scriptural, but 
Uh, there is an element of truth to his argument that we do have sinful nature, but the problem is that the whole thing is based on two extreme opposites. But this video in particular was not really meant to deal with that. Because uh, again, I've done videos refuting Pelagianism. It's just to show the fact, as I've shown in these clips, that Matt Slick's arguments are just emotionally based and, you know, when he would quote scripture, just usual Calvinistic proof text. So it just goes to show the fact that Calvinism is man-centered, you know, man-exalting, and a man-made theology. It's just Gnosticism, that's all the thing is. So, just wanted to show you guys that. It's just based on emotion when you get down to it, like most heresies are. So, anyway, don't be deceived by Calvinism. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye. Thank you.